Okay, the live stream is loading, so let's give it one second. We are live now. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Gabriela, and we are going to speak about how to build digital future for Houston. Let me share my screen. So these are our all-stars panel today, and I am so excited to hear from all of these leaders. Uh, before we will start, my name is Gabriela Zahoranska. I lead General Assembly in Houston and our West Coast expansion. We were proudly based at the ION. We have Christine from the ION leading the panel today. And currently we are virtually in Houston. What is General Assembly? We are a technology education company. We started 10 years ago in New York and now we are in 40 locations all around the world. We are focusing on bringing more people into technology and digital roles by reskilling and upskilling talent. We are focusing on the skills as coding, user experience design, data, marketing, business, and career development. We do this through our full-time courses that are three months long for everyone who wanna step into the world of tech. So for instance, you can sign up for three months long program focused on software engineering. And by the end of the program, you will become a junior software engineer and we will help you to find a job. We held the same program for data science and user experience design. On top of this, we held 10 part-time courses about various coding languages, product management, and more if you wanna just upskill. And then we held tons of classes and webinars just like this one. You can find our webinars on ga.co slash education and also all our options for education. And now without further ado, Christine, this is all yours now. All right. Well, Gabby, thank you so much for bringing us all here. And every time I learn uh, more and more about GA, I am just ready to sign up and take a program. So you have a lot of supporters here in Houston. The work you do is so incredibly needed. And also the partnerships that you've made are, are, are incredible as well. So hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Christine Galeb. I'm the Senior Director of Programs at the ION. And in that role, I oversee our accelerators at the ION, our ION Academic Network, our Workforce Development Programs, and our ION Mentor Program. And I'm so thrilled to be able to moderate this fabulous panel. So I will cut my introduction here, and I will choose our panelists at random to introduce themselves uh, to us today because their insights, their advice, their wisdom is unparalleled. So I know I said at random, but in the green room earlier before our panel, David and I were chit-chatting about the importance of just one word, one word at a time. And I think that's a very important theme for us as we think through um, really what digital transformation looks like in Houston, what it means for Houston to be on this mission, to lead the way in digital transformation. So David, let's start with you and you can tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am David Haynes. I'm the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Baker Ripley. Uh, Baker Ripley is one of the largest nonprofits in the, in the region. Um, we touch about 500,000 people across a spectrum of about 70 different services uh, with about 60 different locations. Uh, our prim primary focus and, and the topic of this conversation is really about building mental, physical, and uh, social capital. And uh, we do that through uh, community centers, uh, community center programming. We also do it through adult education. Um, we do that through our partnerships with folks like Verizon and, and Comcast, uh, really, really leaning, leaning in on the, uh, the digital space. So super excited to have this conversation. Um, we, are, we are a 114 year old organization um, and we are all about making sure this region remains a place of opportunity. Awesome. David, thank you so much. And, you know, you set us up here with these notions of, of capital, of partnerships, of this collaborative work that we do. And so to continue um, that piece of the conversation, let's go over to Brian, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Brian Black. I am the Director of uh, Regional Workforce Development with the Greater Houston Partnership. Uh, for those who don't know the Greater Houston Partnership, we're the uh, regional economic engine, the chamber of commerce, if you will, for the great 13 county region that makes up the, the Houston, the Gulf Coast area. Um, we are the chamber, the public policy uh, area. And, you know, we also have a focus on workforce. So what I do is uh, I'm in an initiative called Upskill Houston, 
where we try to address some of those issues in the workforce, uh, both from an uh, employer side and from an educational institution side to make sure that the jobs that are driving the economy of tomorrow for Houston are being filled with the local citizens and young people and adults uh, from our region. So uh, as we continue to look at what uh, are, is changing in the job market, in the economy, in the labor market, we wanna make sure that everybody's kind of sharing in that prosperity and all that kind of comes together to make up uh, Upskill Houston and the, the initiative that we, we lead. So uh, we're really excited to have this conversation today and I think it's very timely. So thanks for having me. Awesome. And, and Brian, you brought up this uh, notion of workforce development. And so I'm going to call up uh, Carlicia to talk about one of Houston's leading colleges and their workforce development program. So Carlicia, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Christine, for the um, introduction. And thank you, everyone, for having me here today. So I am with Lone Star College. And as Christine said, it is the largest higher education institution in the greater Houston area. We have seven campuses that serve over 87,000 students uh, each semester. And um, we um, offer more than 200 degree and certificate programs, including three bachelor um, programs that we recently started, um, we added. We are rep recognized as one of the top degree producers for minorities. We're also a minority serving institution with 65% of our student population making up people of color. And a large part of our role is to really support the Houston's economy by actually facilitating the skill development of um, Houston's workforce. And so we partner with pretty much um, most of the folks that are on the panel today in the work that we're doing. And so I'm super excited to be here and um, just to have a conversation. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Carlicia, for not only the work that you lead and, and the work that you do in the community, but also for, for, for coming to the table, for creating this role model for us and this example. And so last, but certainly, certainly not least, I'll turn it over to Christina uh, from KPMG to talk a little bit about herself. Thanks so much for the introduction and thanks so much for having us on for having me on today. So my name is Christina and I'm with KPMG. I lead our experienced higher recruiting focused on technology enablement and transformation delivery. So that can range anywhere from cybersecurity, ERP implementations, data scientists, we hire designers, um, UI UX. So just a wide variety of different individuals um, within our Houston and then KPMG firm. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, attendees, you are in for a real treat. So let's hop right in to some of the questions that I'll be asking our panelists for today. So let's kick things off. A lot of the work we do, if I could kind of boil it down to maybe two words, and you can certainly say, well, I would add a third word and please do, but I'd say it comes back to economic development, right? And, and those two words are kind of our North stars here as we create access to greater economic development, to create more resilient economic development. So my first question to the panel is before COVID, so think back to that time when we were all in person, um, let's get to some of the main events that impacted Houston's economic development. What, what events are, are top of mind for you? I know we all sit in a little bit of a different area, but certainly we overlap. So why don't we go, um, Brian, we'll start with you. What events just kind of come to mind, first come to mind for you in terms of Houston's economic development in a pre-COVID world? Yeah, so that's a good question. I would say it's pre-COVID and it's also uh, in parallel to COVID. Um, because we don't want to focus on you know what has been driven by COVID, but it's really what's been accelerated due to COVID is um, the the um, the digitization of everything, right? So um, whether you're talking about the healthcare space, whether you're talking about manufacturing, or you're talking about kind of uh, even more traditional retail jobs, everybody had to, has has had to figure out solutions quickly, and that was all happening pre-COVID. So. I think even though the question is kind of, let's set COVID aside, I don't really think you can because it's really driven so much of what we're doing in all of these spaces right now. 
Um, and I think a lot of companies that have come up in the Houston area have come up with a lot of really innovative solutions and have kind of had to think on their feet to, um, to, to address a lot of these issues. And I think an, another thing that's been happening before COVID that we're still, still seeing now is a lot of headquarter uh, movement to the Houston area. Um, I, I know y'all probably seen what's happened with HP and NRG and some of the large players, but you're also seeing a lot in the startup space. And this is all uh, related to just the, the good opportunities that everybody's kind of recognizing here in the Houston area. And I think, uh, you know, it's so hard that for anybody to set COVID aside, but I do think that is all, um, that was all going on before. And if anything, it's just been accelerated by, by what's going on and how everybody's had to innovate constantly right now. I love that. And, and you're kind of keeping us grounded in this theme of acceleration, right? So you're you're not letting us get caught up in this COVID kind of mindset. So Christina, I'd love to hear your answer to this question too, because I know KPMG has been a leader in this space and, and has been long before COVID. So, so I'd love to hear your answer. Well, I think coming out of 2020, you know, putting COVID aside, it was an election year. I think everybody was really nervous. Nobody could have predicted the beginning of a recession, a global pandemic, an election year. It was like the perfect storm for what are we gonna do now? What's gonna happen to our economic development? What's gonna happen to jobs? What, what do we do? And I think coming out of 2020, we, we definitely saw an increase in regards to digital transformation and solutions, right? We saw a remote workforce. How do our clients prepare, better prepare for remote workforce? thinking about infrastructure, thinking about cloud, thinking about data points. So those are the things that we had to help our clients get prepared for. Think about all the folks that had to go um, remote and thinking about cybersecurity attacks, right? Thinking yeah. about the supply chain piece of it, right? And how the supply chain just quickly changed and how people are getting receiving goods and the demand. So those are the things that we saw as an opportunity to help our clients prepare for a better, again, today, from a digital transformation standpoint, we helped, you know, a couple of energy companies in Houston prepare for that, right? Building a better infrastructure and a network, how the data is stored, how their IT service management tools are ticketed. And so we were able to help our clients kind of transition out of COVID into a more profitable, more effective, more efficient organization. I love that. And, and you, a lot of your comments kind of center on that preparation, right? You know, not being reactive to it. And so I'd love to turn this over now to Carlicia because I know Lone Star has been at the forefront of the programs that prepare our students um, to, to kind of not react to changes, but be a little more proactive. So Carlicia, over to you. Yes, no, thank you so much. And so you're right, you know, Lone Star um, is a community college and typically community colleges are open access institutions that award various certificates and associate degrees. And so we have um, been very intentional looking at Houston, looking at where some of the skill gaps are, nursing, cybersecurity. And so uh, we were proactive and Three years ago, we were able to offer three bachelor um, three bachelor degrees, and I think I mentioned them earlier um, in the conversation where I talked about um, a bachelor's in cybersecurity, something that's really important. Bachelor in nursing. These are really in response to what the business community has said um, are some of the needs that are needed specifically for the future workforce. I'd also like to, you know, when I think about your question, I, I actually want to step, um, you know, this is the context that I'm in at Lone Star College as the Chief Diversity Officer, is that as we talk about um, economic development, specifically pre-COVID, I think that there um, had been a major theme in the Houston area around resiliency and equity. And so there were a variety of conversations that were happening. And I think that um, similar to what, what Brian said, you know, as you know, we can talk about pre-COVID, but then we also have to um, speak to uh, what's been illuminated by COVID. And so those inequities have been exacerbated. You know, for our students, we saw it um, in terms of um, access to technology, tran transitioning from, you know, in-person environment to a digital um, digital environment. And so we had to react really quickly, making sure that we had resources. And so it's making us think about just in general, make, you know, as, as a, 
a community college that is offering access to um, eliminating barriers. One of the things that we have to address at the forefront when we have a student that is registering is what their, um, you know, their technology needs are, their digital, um, their access to technology so that we can, to the greatest extent possible, minimize that digital divide for them outside of the campus environment, which is really, really important. I love that. And you're setting us up here to move kind of from the campus to the community. So no, I, I did not plan this order of questions, uh, but I think this is due to the nature of our fabulous panelists that we can bounce the conversation around and guide our words such that we arrive here with David. And I'd love to hear from your perspective, working with the community, how, how link it back to economic development and uh, access to digital services for us. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, thanks for that. And and I'll say that, it, that this region has suffered through not only the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, we were coming out of Harvey, um, and the communities that already that were already vulnerable, uh, the problems that they were having, whether it was access to the resources, the digital resources, or any uh, just basic needs, they were already stretched thin. Um, and then you layer on top of that the pandemic, you layer on top of that winter storm, Yuri. All those things are a region that we that we live in, and they are all a part of a a super big, you know, a huge challenge uh, for organizations to try to navigate for folks that don't necessarily have all of the types of resources they need in order to take advantage. So when we think about access, we think about true access, not that they have just the, the access to a classroom, but access to the right type of education um, that allows them to then move into that socioeconomic mobility ladder uh, and allows them to access the types of jobs in their backyard. So for us, it was about making sure those vulnerable populations, those asset limited populations had the, the resources they needed in order to take advantage of things like Car uh, Carlicia said and uh, Brian alluded to. So, uh, and then also from the KPMG, so those, those jobs that, that Christina talked about, making sure those folks that that want those opportunities, have the right types of resources to get those opportunities. I love that because David, you're creating an, an ecosystem here. And, and certainly with the rest of the panelists, we're creating an ecosystem where we're not just kind of, you know, I'm doing this work here and you're doing this work here and we can just keep doing our work in whatever direction. We're aligning, we're creating those pathways, we're identifying needs and then setting up participants to get what they need um, and then continue on with the rest of their journey. So I'd love to turn to our next question now where we think through and let's definitely hear about all of the exciting projects that each one of our panelists is working on. So I know this is gonna be incredibly hard, so I'll give us a moment to think, um, but, if any projects or initiatives come to mind that you're especially excited about and you wanna share with our attendees today, I would love to hear about them. So, I said uh, I'd give a minute. So what I know Carlisi jumped, jumped right in. So she's ready to go. This is no, why I love our panelists. Go ahead. No, no, no. So I, I was jumping, I was only jumping ahead to say that I definitely want to be able to summarize what Lone Star College is doing, but I, I just joined Lone Star College. And so for pri prior to that, I had been working with Harris County on the development of the Department of Economic Equity and Opportunity, which will focus on economic development, workforce development, small business development, and also look at opportunities within Harris County's um, vast supply chain to engage um, uh, minority and women businesses. And I'm super excited that Harris County has taken on this role and centralized not just economic development and economic, but economic opportunity and equity and merge the two together. Because I, you know, there are so many disparate things. We have the a community, a, a county and a region of haves and have nots. You have folks that are living, a great deal of our population is living below poverty that is under skilled and under, you know, um, underworked. And so I'm super excited about that because even in my work with Lone Star College, as I transition into Lone Star College, there is a tremendous opportunity for partnership because this, you know, the county is now thinking proactively about how to be a player and to facilitate that work with partners like KPMG and, and Lone Star College and Baker Ripley and the Greater Houston Partnership. So I'm super excited about that.
And awesome. I'll just lean in there uh, and just say from the digital space, uh, we are super excited about partnerships with folks like Comcast and Verizon. And that really is allowing us to bring the digital access to communities that may have been underserved prior. Um, and what we are hoping to accomplish with uh, our, our Verizon uh, partnership is really getting those folks from from uh, a lack of digital literacy through to some level of digital credential um, that allows them to then go access jobs, uh, sort of similar to those that were mentioned in KP KPMG. Um, and, and so for us, it's all about providing that, that access and, and giving folks the opportunity. You know, I would just add, you know, there's a ton of partnerships happening. And I think a lot of them over during the past year have formed where there are uh, employers and educational institutions like, um, like Lone Star who have formed these one-off relationships to address specific needs of the, uh, the community that's looking to get into uh, uh, employment opportunities. So uh, em employers have kind of taken the reins to say that, you know, we're going to partner with Lone Star we're going to partner with San Jacinto. We're going to partner with U University of Houston, and we're going to help establish the curriculum and the program that tie directly into the jobs that we know are part of our economy. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Head uh, at, at Lone Star, I know he focuses on this, and his team is super focused on making sure that the students who are coming out of Lone Star are, are he heading directly into in, uh, impactful opportunities. And and I think that is, uh, that's, uh, you, you asked, what, what are we excited about? And I think just people kind of rethinking the education model in a lot of different ways and trying to be more uh, nimble and short, shorter term in terms of how people can train and get directly into those uh, uh, work and uh, just career opportunities in general is something we're seeing a lot of. And, and to piggyback, piggyback off that, I think it's thinking about, you know, candidates who come to our pipeline that may have come out of a non-traditional program. We do hire a lot from like General Assembly. Maybe they've done something in a previous life and they wanted to switch and they wanted to be more hands-on and be kind of UI UX strategist. And so we're seeing a lot of that. And I think with as KPMG is a firm, as the workforce continues to change and grow and be really fluid, it's being mindful and being aware of how do candidates come our way? Not everybody's gonna come through a traditional four-year program, right? It's looking at folks that maybe have worked their way through school and their internships were really the part-time jobs they have. And that shows us things of, you know, time management and being able to kind of like David, you said, you know, upskill their, their background, right? And so I think that's what KPMG is really driving for from an innovative standpoint, right? Looking at candidates that really are coming to us from just so many different backgrounds. Cause it's really about the aptitude and the attitude that we look for. Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, pivoting back into, I opened up with something that was not Lone Star, but just pivoting back to Lone Star. One of, you know, one of the things that we have is a corporate college. And so we're working in partnership with, for example, Verizon, similar to the partnership that Baker Ripley has um, to actually place some of our students into those opportunities directly with Verizon. And so we're making sure that the programs are actually customized to our business needs. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned at the at my intro, we, you know, in addition to offering, you know, hundreds of um, associate degrees and certificate programs, you know, we also expanded to offer an affordable, you know, un, you know, bachelor's degree in um, nursing um, to respond to the Texas Medical Center and um, energy manufacturing and trades management to really um, um, respond to the industries that are surrounding Houston and cybersecurity, because those were some of the things that um, the businesses in um, Houston um, said they needed um, individuals for. Awesome. And I want to acknowledge before I get to our next question, I want to just throw in a question coming in um, from our audience here. So there were two uh, questions that came in. Adrian is asking, are there programs at Baker Ripley or Lone Star to educate students to work in electronic manufacturing? So I'd like to give uh, David or Carlicia a chance just to respond to that question or guide us in the right direction here. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, we offer a variety of certificate programs and as a part of our expansion into bachelors, we have the energy manufacturing and trade management. 
Um, but we also have certificate um, programs that support individuals. And so if companies and organizations are coming to us saying, hey, we need this particular thing, we can certainly cater to it. Um, we've also modified the format. So the traditional 14 to 16 week semester in some, in some of our campuses, we're offering eight week semesters or certificate programs that are truncated so that individuals can actually get, um, get to work sooner and faster. And I'll just just add, uh, while we, we don't offer those uh, those types of courses directly, we would be pushing them. Um, we navigate folks into those spaces uh, that Carlicia just mentioned uh, with Lone Star as a, one of our partners. So uh, we make sure that they are aware that the, the program exists um, and then give them the types of resources to go and, and, and figure out how to navigate that particular system. And if I can just add to that, you know, one of the benefits of an affordable community college education is that we have tons of resources from the federal government, even in response to, to COVID. And so there are ways where individuals throughout the community can access opportunities and not actually have to pay. And so we're, we're making sure that we're helping them navigate that process. And so there are tons of resources out there for workforce and in continuing education. And so we wanna make sure that folks know that those resources exist and um, come here and we'll, we'll get you started. I love that. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Chris's comment here in question. How about recognizing the 30 years of experience and giving that credit? So I think if you need uh, someone to help you with the policy to reform that policy, I think that's a great idea because I think everyone comes to the table with different experiences. And we've got to be able to integrate that into our next steps as we think about economic development and workforce development. So Chris, hi, I'm waving at you. Um, I know you're in the audience. I think that's a great point. Um, I do want to shift a little bit here, go off script just a little bit because one of the words that keeps coming up in our conversation is partners and partnerships. And we talk about partners and partnerships and I'd love to pause for a moment and think through and hear some of our panelists' thoughts on what exactly makes a good partner. So if, if I'm looking for a partner to do my work with me, what am I looking for? What, what skills or attributes or mindsets maybe would I look for? So Christina, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start you off on this one here and I'd love to hear your thoughts. When I think about a good partner, we think about partnering with different, you know, entities within Houston, it's kind of collaboration. It's looking at it from a standpoint of what can, you know, KPMG for, do for that organization and vice versa. When I think about, you know, a candidate coming in and becoming a good, you know, um, collaborative, like a candidate for the firm, it's one of those things that looking at their background, not just looking at their, you know, quote unquote resume, but looking at the other soft skills they bring to the table. You know, I think, you know, Chris brought up a good point of experience, right? Looking at attitude and attitude, what are those transferable skills that would make you a great um, steward of the firm, right? Because we're always, for KPMG, we call it being a student of the firm. Because where you start is not going to be where you finish. You can kind of continue to grow and learn and, and upskill. And so when I think about the partnerships we could have, you know, with Greater Houston, we do a lot with Greater Houston. Um, currently still listening to, about your Bachelor of Cybersecurity. I'm so excited to follow up with you afterwards to talk about that program because, you know, cybersecurity is such a hot topic. Think about all the e-commerce that's going on. And so just, you know, us educating each other about the opportunities that we have for each other. And, you know, Dave, you brought up a good point. What are those other programs? If, you know, if it's not a Baker Ripley, who can I redirect them to, right? And so I think everybody becoming aware of the programs that we have to help continue to Houston's economic development. Yeah, and I'll just add there for, for us, really it's about um, experts being experts, right? So you allow the experts that, that are experts in their field to be those experts. And a, a good partner for us is one that's flexible, a one that allows for us to do the work that we do. We do community development work. Uh, we are in the community. We know the community. Um, we know what the, the, the fit for purpose uh, solutions might be for some of the communities that we serve. Uh, and when a partner comes to us and they allow us that flexibility to provide the type of programming um, that we know is necessary and needed in the community, it allows us to put those resources efficiently and effectively in the hands of the folks that need it the most. So for us, the, the key word there is flexibility and trust. Mm -hmm. And I'll add, um, add to it. When I think of partnership, I think of um, something that I learned in the context of my marriage is that 
a partnership should help you reach your full potential. And so what I mean by that in this particular context, when, when we're talking about all of the organizations, all of us that are represented here, is that when we enter into a partnership, Christine talked about really the reciprocity, right? So individuals um, providing resources. So if Lone Star College is entering into a partnership with a, a corporation, then that means that we want to help them maximize their profit by offering them connections to a strong, capable workforce. If a student is coming into Lone Star, um, they're looking for to, to access opportunities and to eliminate barriers. And in many instances, take their families um, you know, out of poverty and have that economic impact. And we want them to reach their full potential through the education that they receive at Lone Star. And so, you know, when Baker Ripley is serving the community, they're, they're again, um, trying to fill those gaps so that individuals can reach, those communities can reach their full potential and we can leverage those resources. And so I think that a, a good partnership is one that takes you takes you from here to 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 here. So it takes you to the next level, helps you reach uh, a fuller, better potential, and helps really complete what you're looking for. It helps it helps serves the gaps. And I would uh, I would add to that that uh, first of all, I think a good partner uh, is a really good listener. Um, I think that's like maybe that's just personal opinion, but first and foremost, I think. It's something that we could all be better at. Um, but uh, selfishly from a workforce development and kind of building this collective table that we're trying to do in the Houston region, I think what a good partner is, is somebody who um, is willing to kind of give a little in order to uh, realize that long-term it's a, it's a kind of an opportunity gain for themselves and everybody who is collectively working together. It's kind of a let's grow the pie mentality. And I think, uh, yeah, for, for this workforce topic specifically, I think it's, it can really be a powerful thing. And uh, that, that can be, you know, sharing of training resources, that can be sharing of educational resources, that can be sharing of personnel, uh, different ways that thinking creatively across our different institutions to really work to build this broader table uh, and make sure that the talent is getting where it needs to go. And that's that might be a little too specific for the workforce issue, but I, that's the way I think of uh, co collective partners in this specific space. Uh, I, I do wanna real quick get back to Chris's point about making sure that we're harnessing that experienced talent. I think he raises a good point there, which is, um, we need to do a better job of making sure that those with 30 to 35 years of experience who are maybe close or semi-retired, that we are, we are leveraging that expertise and that subject matter expertise and building it back into the workforce pipeline. Uh, just because jobs are digitizing doesn't mean that there isn't a ton of information and just subject matter and lifelong knowledge that can be built into you know what we can do to make these jobs better for everybody long term. I love that, and I love you know something that that is kind of inherent in that comment too. And and Brian, in your response, there's this notion of um, translational skills, right? And I think Christina said this earlier. When you come in, it is not expected that you're going to stay where you are, right? It, it is expected that you're taking this path wherever that path leads. And so I think, too, as we think about Houston's industries and talent, um, as we think about, you know, the names that we've called ourselves throughout the decades, the energy capital of the world, energy 2.0, energy transition, how are we actually creating those pathways to capture the richness of experience of Houston citizens? I think that's maybe a question um, for, for another panel. So we can come back maybe in a few weeks and do another panel. But I think what we're, we're chipping away here is also the future of work, right? So, so what does this future of work look like? I, I remember my first career, I, I used to work in investment management in New York and I went to my boss one day and I said, you know, I, I think it's time for me to change careers. And she looked at me and she said, what? You haven't been here 40 years? And I, I looked at her and I was like, oh, 40 years. Oh my, that's a really long time to stay in one place. So I think that as we're 
building this future of work, a future of nonlinear careers, of transferable mindsets and skills, of recognizing that people have those mindsets and skills, what does the future of work look like in Houston? And what types of skills do you all think will be in demand? So let's open that question up. It's a big question, but I think we can tackle it together. I think we're gonna see more remote roles. I think it's one of those things we're gonna see a hybrid of, of remote and then kind of going into the office, right? I think that's one of those things that, you know, as, as a city, we've seen that a lot of people can, can work remotely. And I think it, it, it's helping with that, what I call work-life integration, right? As we are so connected all the, all the time via our phones or laptops, it's helping help with that work-life integration. And so I think for, as a firm, I think it's looking at it from, you know, being kind of more of a hybrid model. I think it's also looking at digital transformation, right? And digital transformation is such a broad term, but what does that take? What are those skills look like? What are those, what kind of individuals do we need? What can, you know, is it cybersecurity? Is it around cloud migration? Is it data analytics? Is it data scientists? And just being open to where are these folks coming from and how do we train folks that maybe started in the path of maybe um, an antiquated skill set and kind of retool and help them get ready for that next step and that next age, right? Because as we know, technology faces in and out. So how do we prepare you know, our citizens for that next age of digital transformation? And it's programs that like Carlicia has where you have you know, certificates and things like that to kind of get them ready for that next stage. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Christine. I think that it's, it's, it's constantly evolving, you know, as we learned in the last two years that, I mean, well, the last 18, I should say the <laughs> last year since the pandemic is that remote work is, is, is something that folks are, um, they've shown productivity has increased. They've shown that it hasn't impacted the bottom line. And so as we start to think about even space and location, you know, Houston is really driven by its construction industry, billions of dollars in, in construction is spent. And I do think that as we think about the future of work, I don't think that construction is going away and that it's not going to continue to be a leading industry. But I do think that the, the way we design the city and, and, and the way we think about what we're building spaces for will change. And so the construction industry will be impacted by it. But I also think that businesses are finding value and they're reducing their, their, their footprint and their, the carbon footprint of having people commute. So I think that that is going to also um, really impact our region tremendously. Um, it's just trending in that direction. Also, I also you know, find that the future of work is also going to be dictated by our future workforce. Our future workforce, hmm. um, they're not you know, they're not interested in, you know, what I'm sure many of us have had to do, you know, all, you know, our career, 12, 14 hour days, um, they're really interested in work-life balance and flexibility. And so uh, there is going to have to be consideration for those dynamics um, and those expectations that folks have, um, because they just want to, you know, there's a, there's a desire to have a better quality uh, of life and work-life balance um, going into the future. So I, I kind of think of three specific things when I think of this, since we're on a digital future panel, I'm going to get kind of specific on that. Uh, I think of the intersection of the digital digitization of work with uh, our port and, and logistics and maritime, all of that space. I think that is going to be massive for the region. And then I think of the digitization of healthcare, the intersection of digital work and what it's doing to the largest healthcare uh center in the world. I think that's massive and it's already changed jobs, created new jobs, created new almost almost sub industries over the last year. And then the third one that I'm really excited about that I think you're seeing a ton of energy in is, um, is um, just this next wave of where energy and renewables is going and how Houston has a huge opportunity to get this right. And uh, if we do, it can be really impactful. Uh, and we have the, we're the youngest city in the country and if we get that right and we can grasp our younger population and turn them into those next wave of innovators in, in that renewable space, in that digital workspace, I think it's just a huge opportunity. I think those are kind of the three core areas where that's going. 
And I'll just add um, just to just to kind of piggyback on some of that uh, that was already said, which I think that this is a, there's always an ebb and flow where we have uh, a time where specialists are the, the order of the day and everyone specializes and gets very nuanced and very focused on a really um, discreet um, background and, and skill set. And then we have an ebb and flow where people look to generalists. And, and then within that space, I think we, we're going to be looking for things like critical thinking skills and, and professional types of development that allow folks to move between those all that's been mentioned here. So they allow them to come into um, one role, but also be flexible enough and durable enough and resilient enough to move into a different type of role because as what's been men mentioned it's dynamic uh, the future of work is going to be very very dynamic and it's going to require a high level of adaptability and a high level of resilience and if i can just circle back you know i want to make sure that we're always thinking of who could be left behind you know just in terms of the future of work and so as we is is we recap everything that everyone is saying christine you know, I'm concerned about the folks that have, um, that don't have access to technology, that continue to face um, barriers that are uh, not there. And so I just want to make sure that as we think about the future of work, we're also thinking about ways um, to bring those um, that are often marginalized and disenfranchised and left behind. So this is why I love this panel, because you're, we're all on the same page here. And, and so the, the direction now we're going is we have this picture of this, you know, great future of work, right? One of remote flexibility, of, of adaptability, of resilience, of um, be, transferable mindsets. And I love that Carlicia brought up this point because we're, we're here in this virtual Zoom room and we're privileged to be on this panel. Right, the audience members are privileged to be in the audience. And so let's think about the people who are not in this room. And, and I'd love to kind of tilt our conversation a little bit to the strategy behind making sure that we truly, as we're moving towards this great future, we truly consider, okay, who, who is not with us right here and right now? And so the question to the panelists is, as we think about closing this skill gap, what is top of mind from a very strategic perspective to make sure that we're closing this gap equitably, right? In other words, we're not closing it for some people um, and, and furthering the divide, but that we're actually closing it equitably. What's, what, what are a few strategies from the work that you've done that would help close, us, close this gap equitably? And I'll start with us. Uh, you know, we at Baker Ripley, we pride ourselves on on doing thorough assessments, right? So um, it's getting down into the weeds, into that granular granular uh, assessment of a community, and understand what true access actually looks like. Uh, and then it's going out and finding resources, whether it's in the public sector, the private sector, uh, or the academic sector, uh, and then bringing those together through some level of a mechanism like a nonprofit to deploy those resources where that assessment tells you they're needed. Um, and for us. Uh, it, it is it's, it's literally pulling back the, the curtains and asking the neighbors what it is that they aspire to do and what it is they aspire to have in their backyards and have access to, and then pulling those resources from all the folks that are on this call here uh, into that space to allow them that true access. But we, you can't do any of that work without a true assessment. And I think a lot of times you, you have to try a... Um, uh, you try a, a blanket approach uh, and it's not fit for purpose. So you have to get back and you have to go into those neighborhoods, ask those questions, get that feedback and incorporate that into any strategy that you de uh, develop. And I would, I would just, I would, um, I would go back to when you asked us what a good partnership looks like and integrate just the concept of partnership. I think that in order for um, in order for us to actually make the meaningful progress and to eliminate those barriers, it really does come down to partnership, the collective impact of we've got a community-based organization, we've got a private sector, you know, a, you know, organization, we've got a higher education institution, and then we have a convener um, of the business and variety of industries um, that's on the call today. I think that the collective impact requires that we think intentionally about where 
where we are, the potential that we have just in terms of our global economy and all of those things. And think about those, intentionally focus on those that um, continue to face those barriers and collectively um, develop a strategy that is community focused, that is community focused and really has the input that um, David mentioned, but that also, um, you know, challenges the business community to be adaptable and to be flexible so that we can integrate these folks and we can minimize these barriers and make sure that we are not just, you know, you know, we want to provide access to education, but we want to make sure that, you know, we, you know, we have 87,000 students that we understand some of the barriers that our students are facing. And we're collectively working with all of the other resources like Baker Ripley to make sure that those needs are met so that they can continue to persist and succeed. Um, within our institution. But I do think that it's um, strategically, it's a collective impact. Um, everyone has to be at the table, namely in the center of that table has to be the community and the individuals that face those barriers. And oftentimes I've been on the policy side and worked in government for 20 years. Oftentimes we're around the table, but the community themselves, the, the ones that give us the data points that we're assessing are not actually there with us. And I think that um, that's that's what's needed. Christina, you wanna go or do you want me to go? As it's also starting, you know, at the younger levels too. It's educating, you know, it's starting at, you know, elementary school age and getting them involved in, you know, what does it look like to go work for a firm like a KPMG, it's just an example, but also equipping them to set, get set up for success. You know, we are involved in things like junior achievement, um, first book where we, you know, give books to kids that traditionally wouldn't have books in their homes, right? It's setting up that foundation of learning and lifelong learning. And so it's not just looking at, you know, at a collegiate level, but really starting it early, investing in things like Girls Who Code to make sure that we are setting up those perimeters just along the way as, you know, an individual grows in their educational career from the time they're in elementary school, you know, to high school till they go to college of, you know, what are the opportunities in technology? And it's just educating, you know, you know, at all ages about the opportunities within digital transformation. But definitely starting at a young age and you know like I said KPMG is really committed to that you know when pre-COVID we were really involved in the schools and going and like I said junior achievement and going in and you know um, reading with the kids those things and those types of relationship form that path to continue to get to this is where I want to be you know maybe in the next 12 years but definitely starting with those building blocks is really important for KPMG. I agree with all three of y'all. Uh, I would just add, um, I think also we have to acknowledge if, you know, that this recovery has been super bifurcated between the haves and the have nots as was mentioned. And I think there have been kind of systemic mechanisms put in place over time to only recruit as part of the hiring process that it was meant to only recruit certain people and companies need to reevaluate their hiring process what what has been put into place why you have certain requirements on job applications why how it takes certain there's only certain ways people can even identify these jobs as a possibility what is the language in those jobs all these things impact who is getting into these opportunities so if there's going to be true you know truly a, a bridge of that skills gap every companies need to acknowledge that these things have been put in place for decades to actually address them I love all the responses here. And, and as I'm sitting here listening, I'm thinking, okay, it definitely takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> and it, it takes a village that is all on the same page, right? Is speaking the same language, is understanding the same data. And I want to pause here because we haven't really talked about data in our conversation. So I want to maybe throw this question out because how we use data, right, it, inherent to transformation, you know, you're going from one state to another. So that implies that you've received new data that makes you change in, in some way or another. But I, I wanna maybe spotlight this question of data, right? Are, are we set up as companies, organizations, um, colleges, institutions, are, are we set up to kind of leverage the power of, of the collective data? And if so, I, I see Brian's already kind of, he's like, oh no, where's she going with this? But, 
But how, how do we use data more effectively in the roles that we're in and in the with the people whom we serve to, to help us actually build this transformation? I, I, I'm happy to start. I, I think, are we set up properly? The answer is no, we're not. Um, I think from thinking of jobs as a, you know, as or careers as a way to make families sustainable and support themselves over time, we're kind of working from a place where we have no way to look at what outcomes are or what 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 actually inputs are leading to outcomes over a life or a, the life of a child until they get into the workforce. There's we just don't really have the the uh, the tools and resources at our disposal to do that right now is would be my uh, I guess my simple way to answer that question. And I would I guess I would say that I think that you know. I think that we do have data and we do understand some of the things that in, um, inhibit individuals from being successful and what leads to what leads to the gaps. Um, I think that the we have the data, we we understand, we see who the most vulnerable populations are. I think that we've not tackled the policy. So we we have the data, mm -hmm. but we're not leveraging, and so policy framework system. So Brian previously said, he says, you know, people have to be realistic about the barriers that they create and why they select who they select, right? And so if we're not addressing that, if we're not looking at that policy, um, then there will continue to be a barrier. If we are only concerned with, you know, the bottom line, you know, in terms of profit, right? Then, and we're, still missing the fact that we're still disconnecting individuals. And so I think that, you know, we have data and um, we can we we can leverage it how how we want to, but if we're not leveraging it for change and true transformation, um, as leaders, all of us are respective influencers and leaders within our organizations, then it's not helpful. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm echoing Kalisha. I don't even need to say much um, because it is about, but, but I'll just add, you know, it's about asking the right questions though, right? So we have uh, a whole host of folks on this call who will go back to their office and they'll set, set up a, a set of questions that are important to their organization, but it's not connected to the broader uh, four pillars, right? So when you think about the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, uh, and the academic sector, if you're not acti actively asking questions collectively uh, and leaning on each other as experts and with decision makers at the table, not just folks that are pontificating about uh, what they want to see change and they believe in change. You have to have decision makers asking good questions in order to actually take the data that's been created uh, and sometimes really good data has been created, but then make some metrics around that so that you can move the needle in direction of, of travel. So, so for us, it's, it's more about asking good questions and having the decision makers there at the table. And can I just add to when, when David just said decision makers, everything comes at a cost. And so when you have the decision makers there, then we have to be able to have those decision makers be willing to put up the resources to make it happen because everything has a cost. And so what happens is we, we're willing to spend in certain areas, but when it comes to actually dealing with the most vulnerable, it's got a higher cost and either we address it now or it continues to spread and exacerbate for certain communities. Just like David said, you've got to define those metrics. What are those metrics look like? Everybody talks about wanting X or wanting Y, but really putting definitive metrics of how you want to move the needle, right? And looking at it in stages. I think, you know, when we talk in broad brush terms of, you know, having a diverse talent and making sure that we do what we can to, you know, kind of like you, Brian talked about, you know, looking at the job description, but everything is in theory, but really putting definitive metrics on it. How do we move the needle? Who else is involved? You know, Carlisa, you said, you know, it's the decision makers. Like you said, it's going to come at a cost, but what's the overall, you know, ROI? You know, it's having, you know, different type of um, a diverse work talent with different walks of life and who brought in different experiences. And they're going to show, you know, the current workforce, what, 
they may have done and just bring in a different light. And that's what we need, right? Thinking about what are those definitive metrics to move the needle and who is involved and making sure we talk about partnerships that we have the right partners involved to help move the needle. Because we can't do it solely, we can't do it alone. Who else can we reach out to? I love that. And Christina, you charge us here to, to measure what matters, right? And that's not my own phrase. That's, that's <laughs> the title of a book that I teach to our startups in our accelerator programs. But, but inherent in that phrase, right, measure what matters, you've got to know what measuring means, right, at a basic fundamental question, right, what does measuring mean? And then you've got to know what matters, which is that question that as leaders, as decision makers, we have got to ask ourselves, um, because if, if we don't lead the charge in asking ourselves, well, what truly actually really matters and how do I know, then we're going to end up, you know, kind of creating the same problems that we faced in the past, except creating them at scale because our world is, is at scale now. So measuring what matters here, figuring out the data and the metrics to actually drive and track the progress that we want to make, right? Change is just a word, change, but not all change is good. <laughs> so, so progress is what's needed, right? So we've only got a few more minutes left, um, but maybe we'll come back in a year for part two of this panel. In the few remaining minutes, let's just hear a very quick call to action for our audience members. So I know a few questions came in, um, being asked, Anderson, I think asked, you know, how do I get involved in Houston's innovation ecosystem? How, where do I take my first step? So let's just open this up to our panelists, um, a call to action for our audience members. Well, as a nonprofit, I'll always say resources are always welcome. Um, we take those resources and we deploy them into the community uh, in, in a really effective and efficient ways. Um, those, those resources end up in, as digital access, they end up as uh, access to basic needs, they end up as access to educational opportunities. So uh, contributions to, to Baker Ripley are always welcome from anyone and everyone. I would say, uh, you know, thinking about the stakeholders who might be on the call, if you're a large company, uh, just reassess, rethink about your hiring practices, I think would be a really good call to action. Uh, if you're a startup or a smaller company, think about uh, who you're partnering with. How can you re uh, rethink creatively your partnerships, who in the Houston community you're really working with to, to grow as you continue to evolve as a company, and educational institutions that might be on the call. Uh, just think about how you're developing curriculum, how you're developing those pipelines into good jobs. Uh, I think uh, all of those things are really actionable items right now that people can do to really hopefully build towards that digital divide or that, that digital future that we're working toward. And so I would I would um, really add to what Brian just said. So for big companies and organizations, we want to make sure that we're building the workforce that you need. And so, um, you know, if that is a conversation um, that um, needs to be had so that we're customizing programs and certificates or training our students to be prepared for you, um, please let us know. We, you know, we're always uh, looking to support the business community and to impact the Houston economy. For um, prospective folks that are, you know, I know that Chris Moreland talked a lot about how there's the experienced worker for whether it's the, you know, it's someone who is out of high school to someone that's 30 years in, there's a variety of opportunities to upskill. And we're here to partner with, with you on an individual level um, at something that's um, affordable and accessible um, um, to you. And then, you know, for um, just anyone else, you know, um, you know, community colleges are meant to be a community resource. And so um, our doors are really open to provide that access point for a variety of things, whether it's a, a space for convening or it's taking courses or classes, um, um, you can count on us as a resource um, in the greater Houston area. For KPMG, it's, you know, looking at our potential clients. What can we do from a digital transformation standpoint to make you more an effective, profitable organization for 
folks who've never thought about KPMG as an opportunity, you know, what can we do to help you expand your career? You know, what have you done and what can we help you do from that perspective? So. All right. Well, I, I loved everyone's answers. I love listening to this cry of get involved, get partnered, let's drive towards solutions and let's do so purposefully, strategically, equitably, and let's rethink some of the kind of historical barriers that we've set up because we do live in this emergent future where the transferable mindset is what is emerging as a skill set. The technical skills will never go away. The, uh, the other types of skills, I don't like calling them soft skills. I, I don't know why they're soft skills, but the human centric skills, the neurocognitive skills, everything is neurocognitive, but, but these skills are here to stay. And, and whether it's through going to a class and getting involved at Baker Ripley, at going to Lone Star and taking some of their certification programs, nursing degrees, cybersecurity programs, whether it's getting involved through the Greater Houston Partnership, whether it's getting involved through KPMG and getting uh, better solutions for business decisions, there is a way to get involved here in Houston. So I will end on this note. The ION is the anchor of Houston's 16 acre innovation district. We are opening our building. We have tours. If you would like to come by for a tour in person, please do let us know. Um, we are working with our partners some of which are not present on this call, but a lot of which are. Lone Star is part of our ION Academic Network. Baker Ripley, we're doing work with you. General Assembly, you're our partner. KPMG, a strong partner, and of course, sponsor of Houston Tech Rodeo and Greater Houston Partnership, tying us all together here with the business and workforce development perspective. So thank you all to our panelists and audience members, thank you for joining us today. We do hope to see you soon. So enjoy the rest of Tech Rodeo.